Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Jonah, chapter 1. The book of Jonah, chapter 1. We're going to be spending some time in at the end of the first chapter, and then we're going to uh, be moving into the second chapter today. Let me say, first of all, thank you to uh, Forgiven. What a wonderful and meaningful song, and uh, thank you for sharing that. It, uh, it's a blessing. Amen. And uh, all of us have been there. It's nice when you can sing a song and you can say, I, I know exactly what I'm singing about because you've been through it. And so we thank you for that. And uh, let me just say thank you uh, also to everyone uh, who uh, prayed for our family and especially for Lauren. It's been really amazing um, just uh, how many people have come by the office or called on the phone uh, or sent a text and just to say, hey, you know, how, how's Lauren doing? And so uh, she's doing fantastic. Um, she's doing really well. Um, just very thankful to the Lord um, that, uh, uh, that things were uh, a lot better than, than they could have been. So just praise the Lord for that. But um, I'm just a firm believer in prayer. Amen. And uh, I believe that God works through prayer. And one of the things I found out personally is there are some awesome prayer warriors in this church. And I just want to say thank you. Um, we, we need that. Uh, a church needs those prayer warriors. And uh, it's something that all of us should aspire to. And so I just wanted to say thank you as well. And so if you have your Bibles there, I'm going to be bringing a uh, message uh, today entitled, God of the Pit. God of the pardon, God of the pit, and God of the pardon. Let's go to Lord in prayer as we begin today. Father, thank you for your goodness to us, and Lord, thank you for uh, this uh, just time of special music today, Lord, that just fits just like a hand in a glove, Lord, as far as what we'll be talking about. And Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you would move in this place today in a special way. That you would just be active in our hearts. That you would bring us to a place of decision. And that ultimately, Lord, when we leave here today, that spiritual decisions will have been made. Lives will have been changed. And God, we can live for you in a greater way for having been here. And so, God, we love you. We thank you for who you are and how you work in our lives. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. How can you tell when it's going to be a rotten day? How can you tell when it's going to be a rotten day? Well, you might call the suicide prevention hotline and they put you on hold. You get to work and there's a 60 Minutes news team waiting for you outside of your office. Your twin sister forgets your birthday. Your car horn goes off accidentally and remains stuck as you follow behind a biker gang on the highway. Your boss tells you not to bother taking off your coat. The bird singing outside of your window is a buzzard. You call your answering service and they tell you it's none of your business. And your wife says, good morning, Bill, but your name is George. Uh, that's not good. And, and if you were to meet this guy, you would definitely say that this person is in a pit. And uh, today we're going to be talking about what it means to be in a pit and really what we should do if we find ourselves in a pit. Now, three weeks ago, we looked at the total apathy that Jonah had for God. And if you remember, we said that Jonah had apathy for God, and we said that he also had apathy for the sailors who were in distress there as well. 
And we said that when a Christian becomes apathetic towards God, that he will be apathetic towards people as well. And that's because we know that, listen, if we open our hearts for just a moment and the Holy Spirit has a way to get in, then he will get in. And, and the Holy Spirit can break us, amen? And actually, that's not a bad thing. And of course, we see stories in the Bible where people had hardened their hearts against God. David is a perfect example of that. And uh, God had to come in the back door, so to speak, and, uh, and touch his heart to the place where he became broken for the Lord. And God does that with us as well. And it's a good thing because it's dangerous when we get to the place in our lives where we are ap apathetic towards God, and that apathy towards God causes us to be apathetic towards people as well. Listen, especially lost people, right? How can we be a witness and how can we share our faith with somebody and potentially lead them to Christ if we have apathy towards the people that we're supposed to be reaching? We also talked about the fear of the Lord, and we said that this fear that the Bible speaks of is a healthy fear. This is not a bad thing. There are places uh, in the Bible where it talks about fear is a bad thing, and the Bible certainly says that we're not given a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. But, but we're talking about the fear of the Lord, having a healthy respect for God, both who he is and what he has the power to do. And when these sailors got a healthy dose of the fear of the Lord, they did some remarkable things. First of all, the Bible tells us that they prayed to God. And, and not the false gods that they had been praying to before, but they, they actually prayed to the one true God. And a healthy fear of the Lord will improve your prayer life. Amen? A healthy fear of God will improve your, fair, your prayer life. Not only that, but they sacrifice to God, the Bible says. And a healthy fear of the Lord will help you to make spiritual decisions in your life. And finally, we said that they made vows to God, and a healthy fear of the Lord will help us to make commitments about those decisions that we're making. And so this morning, we want to look at what really happened to Jonah after he was thrown overboard. What really happened to him? Because it's interesting, if you were to maybe pick up your, your average storybook, about Jonah, maybe your, your average children's uh, Sunday school uh, book, and you were to read that, you might believe that Jonah ran because he was afraid of the Ninevites. You might believe that Jonah was swallowed by a whale. You might believe that Jonah was frightened to be inside of the whale. You might believe that Jonah realized that once he was wrong, that that God gave him a second chance. If you were to read a, a typical story about Jonah, that is not the word of God. Those might be the conclusions that you come to, but I'm here to tell you this morning that when you read the Bible account, you realize that some of these assumptions might not be right. And today we want to do our best to separate fact from fiction and understand what really happened to Jonah when he was cast into the sea. And so the first thing that I want us to see this morning is this thought, and that is the God of the pit. The God of the pit. And so look at verse 17 of chapter 1, in the book of Jonah. The Bible says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish, to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, one of the hardest truths for us to realize as we read this portion of Scripture is that while God was Jonah's Savior, he was also Jonah's jailer. Do you ever stop and think about that? 
Oh, yes, in the end, God ended up being his Savior, but, but God was also Jonah's jailer. And in verse 17, the Bible says that this fish that swallowed Jonah really was prepared. God prepared this fish to swallow him. You might even want to say that God designed this fish to swallow Jonah. And it's interesting if you read different Bible commentaries on this portion of Scripture and, you know, the fish, you know, there are uh, some that have said that, well, it could have been uh, a whale. Uh, some say that it could have been a great white shark. Uh, it's interesting if you were to go uh, into uh, just even just a few months ago, there was actually a man uh, this year, back in June, there was a, a gentleman who was actually swallowed by a humpback whale, and he lived to tell about it. True story, and I would, I would encourage you to look it up. But, but, but the thing that we need to understand is this. Whatever it was, the Bible teaches us that God prepared it in order to swallow Jonah. And really, when you look at that, that phrase there, when it talks about, you know, uh, this great fish that was prepared, that the thought of that phrase, the, this great fish, it literally means monster of the deep. Monster of the deep. That's what it means. And so, while it's nice to be able to say, you know, it's the story of Jonah and the whale, we really don't know for sure whether it was a whale or not. We don't know exactly what it was. All we know is that whatever it was, God prepared it. And you might say, well, pastor, why is that so important? Why is that so important? Well, it's important for this reason, because until we make the connection that the God whom we love has most likely listened, allowed, or even designed our pits for us, just as he did Jonah, then we're not going to, to understand how God works in our lives. Perhaps the pit that you're dealing with today was for judgment. Perhaps it was for testing. Perhaps it is for growth. By the way, let me say this as well. Sometimes when we're in a pit, maybe the pit that you're suffering, listen, is because of someone else and because of a decision that someone else has made, you were having to suffer in a pit. But the truth of the matter is, however you slice it, God allows us to go down into pits. Right? Can, can anybody here today can raise your hand and say, Pastor, I've been in a pit before. I've been in a pit, right? We, we all have. We've all been in a pit before. Hey, listen, maybe your pit is a broken marriage. By the way, uh, I would encourage you, uh, we're going to be having our uh, marriage conference coming up at the uh, end of October. And uh, I would encourage you to, to sign up for it. It's going to be incredible. And uh, you might say, well, Pastor, I feel like my... Marriage is pretty good. Well, well, that's great. But if you want to keep it pretty good, then I would encourage you to come to the marriage conference. And, uh, and, and, and by the way, guys, oftentimes we think that our marriage is pretty good. But, but if you ask your wife, uh, she, might, she might answer differently. Amen. And so I uh, just want to mention that. But, but sometimes our pit is a broken relation uh, or marriage or even some other relationship that we're dealing with. Maybe your pit is a broken relationship with your children. Maybe your pit is a financial 
hardship that you're going through. Maybe your pit is a physical infirmity that you're dealing with. Maybe your pit is the job that you're in. Maybe like Joseph, your pit is made up of people who lie about you. Maybe your pit is the loss of someone that you love, which we heard about that just a few moments ago. Whatever the pit is, listen, we must face the harsh reality, listen, that the God that we love and who loves us is ultimately in control of our pit. Right? We, we don't like to, to look at that. We like to focus on God being our deliverer. We like to focus on God being our refuge in a time of trouble. We like to focus on God being our, our healer and all of these incredible attributes of God. But what we don't like to think about is when the testing time comes or when, when we have to go down into the pit to realize that at the very least, listen, at the very least, God has allowed it. God has allowed us to go down into the pit, and ultimately he's in control. Now, I do not believe that God takes delight in our suffering one bit, just the same way as any parent uh, would not take delight in the suffering of their child. I do not believe that God takes delight in any suffering that we go through. Listen, but he does delight in the growth that we gain by being in the pit. And he does delight in the knowledge, listen, that he is working all things together for our good even when we can't understand it right now. Amen? He's still working. He's still working. Listen, I also do not believe this. I do not believe that God will leave us in our pit one second longer than is needed to accomplish his purpose. Maybe you're going through something right now and you're saying, Pastor, I'm in a pit. I'm in a pit. I am going through a difficult time right now in my life. Pastor, I don't know what to do. And sometimes I call out to God and I don't feel like he's listening to me. I don't feel like God hears me. Pastor, what do I do? Hey, listen, I'm here to tell you today. God does not delight in your suffering, and God will not leave you in your pit one moment longer than what is needed to accomplish his purpose in your life. Why do I say this? Hey, listen, when Joseph was ready to be second command in all of Egypt, God rescued him from his pit. When the Hebrews were being tormented by the Egyptians, God sent Moses and delivered them from their pit. When God had accomplished his purpose with Job, he rescued him from his, uh, his pit. When Peter was being sifted by the devil and had learned that he was not as spiritual as he thought he was, then Jesus rescued him from his pit. Psalm 40 and verse 2 says this. You might want to write this down. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, talking about God, out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. That's the God that we serve. That's the God that we serve. And listen, I'm not going to stand up here today and tell you something that's not true. I'm not going to stand up here today and tell you that the Christian life is a rose garden, that there's never any trials and tribulations, there's never any thorns, there's never any difficulties that you have to go through. I'm sorry, I can't do that. And, and if you are here today and, and uh, you have trusted in Christ and the reason that you, you trusted in Christ is because somebody told you that if you do so that, 
that God will take away all of your problems, then I'm sorry, but, but somebody hasn't told you the truth. Yeah, God will take away all of our problems ultimately, but there are times when we have to go through a pit. And I'm going to tell you something right now. I wish I could tell you that I understand the pits, but I don't. Some of them might seem somewhat apparent, but there's some that, that you go through in this life and, and you, or you see somebody going through it and you say, for the life of me, God, I just don't get it. I just don't understand. Um, we had the men's prayer breakfast yesterday, as Keith mentioned, and it's a wonderful, wonderful time. I'm so excited for all the men that came out and excited to just even see it grow and continue to get larger. But uh, we had a great time in the Lord yesterday. But um, when it came time for prayer, I shared uh, with our guys at, at the table we were at that um, uh, we were uh, praying for a, a young man named Mark Perez. And uh, Mark is the, he's the son of my former uh, secretary and, and ministry assistant, and her name is Ann. She's a dear friend of our family. She actually went on to become our children's director, and uh, her influence had a profound impact on my two children growing up. And so we're, we feel like we're just forever in her debt. But, but this is a dear friend of ours, and, and she's, she's gone through some, some terrible trials in her life. And um, yesterday we got the news on Facebook that at 3.39 in the afternoon, um, her son went home to be with Jesus. And um, I don't get it. I don't understand it. Here's a, here's a dear woman that loves the Lord. I mean, loves the Lord. Godly woman. And her son goes in the hospital. He's put on a ventilator. Seems like things are going in a positive direction, and he takes a turn for the worse. And... I'll be honest with you, I just, I just talked to the Lord and, you know, we're praying, praying for a miracle and I said, God, I don't, I don't understand. I mean, you know, some things are, are obvious, some things are apparent that God does and you, you rejoice and you see what he's doing. And sometimes even when things don't seem to go well, you kind of still see what God is doing. But I, 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 just, I just said to the Lord, God, I don't get this. I don't understand this. And then a thought came back to me, and I don't know if this was the Spirit of God or not, but a thought came back to me. It's not your job to understand it. You don't have to understand it. She belongs to the Lord. Her children belong to the Lord. It was interesting, by the way, we were talking on the phone. I had prayer with her a few mornings ago, and she, uh, as far as she knew at that time, uh, he was not a believer. But... Um, she told me, she said, it's interesting that when he went to the hospital, he took his Bible with him. He took his Bible. And she said that they had the opportunity to speak to him the other night and, and say their goodbyes and before, 
before he went on a ventilator. And I don't know what happened. And by the way, let me just say this as well. Sometimes you'll, you'll see where people will say, well, you know, this, this person was lost and then they passed away and, and you'll say, and, you know, uh, they must not have gone to be with the Lord because the last time I talked to them, they were lost. And whenever somebody says that to me, I'll ask them the question, were you with them when they died? Well, no. Well, then be careful. Because I seem to remember that there was a thief on the cross in the Bible. And he didn't do anything good to deserve heaven. Not that we can deserve it, but he didn't do anything that was worthy of praise. He was a thief. And yet, in the last moments of his life, he called on Jesus. And God saved him. Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. But I don't understand it. And maybe you've gone through a pit in your life before and said, God, I just, I'm really trying. I'm really trying to understand what you're doing here, but I'm not, I'm just not seeing it. Maybe it's somebody you love. But that's the time when we have to trust that he is working all things together for our good. That he does love us with an everlasting love. That he, he, that he wanted that young man to be saved more than he wanted to even be saved himself. And I, I don't know. I'm waiting to hear the, the whole story but I just have to wonder you know it's interesting sometimes the only way a person comes to Christ is by being faced with their own mortality you know that sometimes that's the only way somebody will come to Christ and I believe that Jesus this is me okay this is just my personal view but I believe Jesus will return in my lifetime I believe that. I think we should live that way, as if Jesus will return in our lifetime. And, you know, it's interesting that if that's true, you know, we have loved ones that have gone before us, but if Jesus comes back in our lifetime, you know, it won't be so long as we think. And, I, and I, I, I truly believe that one day when we go to be with the Lord and we're reunited with our our loved ones there, I believe that it'll feel like it was just a moment since we last saw him. Now, not only the God of the pit, and I'm so thankful that it doesn't stop there, but finally I want us to see the God of the pardon. The God of the pardon. Look at verses 1 through 9 of chapter 2 in the book of Jonah. Look at this. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly, and he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me out of the belly of Sheol, I cried. And you heard my voice, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas. That's important for you to understand that right there. The flood surrounded me, all your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight. Yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The water surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. Look at this. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit. O oh Lord, my God. You see, a lot of times when we think about the story of Jonah, I, I think we, we kind of picture it like Pinocchio, right? That Jonah's swallowed by this whale and he's just kind of walking around freely inside of, you know, this, this whale and, and uh, you know, he was afraid and so 
uh, God gave him a second chance to go to Nineveh and do what God commanded him to do. But it's interesting that the Bible paints a very different picture. Now, the Bible seems to teach here, listen, that Jonah is uh, brought to the edge of death, but I'm going to submit something for your consideration. And this is my personal theory. I'm not saying that this is the way it is, and I'm not so sure uh, how much it matters, but I want you to think about this for a moment, that it is possible that Jonah actually died and was brought back to life. Say, Pastor, I've never heard that before. I just want you to think about this for a moment. Why would I say this? Well, first of all, keep in mind that it would not be outside of God's character because God brought people back to life both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Amen? So, you know, Jesus wasn't the only one. There, there have been quite a few people that God has brought back to life. Second, in verse 2, the Bible says that Jonah cried out to God from Sheol. Sheol is, is the place of the dead. Okay, that's what it means. It is literal, uh, literally the place of the dead when, it's, when he says that I cried out from Sheol. In, in, in chapter 1, uh, 17 through 2 and verse 1, the Bible says that Jonah, listen, was in the belly of the fish for three days and nights, and then he prayed. And when he prayed, he was really recounting all that had happened after he was thrown overboard. His prayer was like a, a story or like a testimony of what God did in those three days. Not only that, but in verses 5 and 6, they tell us that Jonah, listen, sank to the bottom of the sea because, listen, he recounts seeing the mountains and the seaweed that was wrapped around his head. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment, okay? Because in order to see the, the mountains of the deep, in order to have seaweed wrapped around your head, that would mean that you would have to sink to the bottom. So listen to this. Did you know that the average depth in the Mediterranean Sea is 1,500 meters, listen, or 4,921 feet? Verse 3 says that Jonah was cast into the heart of the sea. Did you know that there's a place in the Mediterranean called the Calypso Deep that is 5,267 meters, listen, or 17,280 feet? feet. You say, well, pastor, that's great. Okay, that's great. It's a nice geography lesson there, right? But here's the thing. Did you know that a record dive for a person with scuba equipment is between 300 and 400 feet? Did you know that even though it may take only minutes to descend to that depth, it can take hours to ascend because they must first stop and allow their bodies to decompress, listen, or risk decompression illness, which can lead to death. Jonah was tired from fighting with the waves, and his body slowly sank to the bottom of the sea. And if Jonah did not die immediately from drowning, listen, the pressure of sinking to the bottom should have killed him. So I don't know for sure if that's what, what, what happened, but it certainly would make sense according to the Word of God. By the way, it's interesting. Jesus made the comparison in Matthew 12 to what was going to happen to him. In Matthew 12, verses 38 through 41, the Bible says, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Listen, and no sign will be given to you except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Listen, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus compared his death and his burial to what happened to Jonah. Isn't that interesting? Jesus died. His body was in the tomb for three days and then rose from the dead. And is it possible that this is what happened to Jonah as well? 
Now, I don't want you to dwell on that because it's just a possible theory. But I want you to think about this as we close today because it certainly adds some depth to the story and we may want to answer some of these questions as well. Listen, what is, the impor- uh, what is important is that we understand the character of God. That we understand the character of God. Because as Jonah sank beneath the waves, listen, and drifted closer towards death, he cried out to God, perhaps with his last breath, he called out to God underwater because he was desperate. Listen, and what I want us to see today is that uh, God heard him, and the Bible says that when the situation was hopeless, that God brought Jonah's life up out of the pit. When it was hopeless, when he was going down with his final breath, he calls out to Almighty God, and God rescued him. Why is that important? It's important because Jonah is no better than you and I. And if God would rescue Jonah, I mean, it, it, it was, I mean, th- this, is, this is the end of the line right? Uh, I mean, this is it. I mean, and, 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 and either God is going to save him or he's not, and yet God's intuition, God's plan was to save Jonah from his pit. And listen, I just want us to think about that today because you might be here today and you're in a pit right now. You say, Pastor, I, I could tell you some stories of pits that I've been in, or I could tell you of a story of a pit that I'm in right now. Well, here's what we need to understand. First of all, God is in control of our pit. Next, uh, God is greater than our deepest hurt. Next, God loves you and ultimately has your best interest in mind when you go down into the pit. And because God will not allow you to stay in the pit any longer than what is needed to accomplish his purpose, we need to understand as well, God is omnipresent. So listen to me. This is good. When you go down into the pit, whatever the pit is, God is there with you. Amen? God is in the pit with you. He didn't just let you go down in the pit and say, okay, I'll see you when you get out. God is there with you. Whatever you're going through in your life right now, you have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you. Whatever you're going through, God is going through it with you. The God of the pit is the God of the pardon. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And I'm going to ask you to stand, if you don't mind, with heads bowed and eyes closed. With heads bowed and eyes closed. I just have three questions for you. The altar is open. If God's touched your heart, you might be here today and you would say, Pastor Paulson, I'm in a pit. Pastor, I'm going through a difficult time right now. Well, then maybe God's calling you to the altar to talk to him about your pit. But let me just ask you, first of all, what is your pit this morning? What is your pit that you're dealing with right now? Next, are you trusting God even though he has allowed you to go down into the pit? Is he still your savior? Can you say like Job, though he slay slay me, yet will I trust him? And finally, Are you trusting God to get you out of the pit that you're in? Now, maybe you're here today and you've never put your trust and faith in Christ as your Savior. Can I tell you something? If you've never trusted Christ, even though you know in your mind that Jesus died for you on the cross, can I tell you something? I'm not sure if there is a greater pit than you could be in, than the pit of being lost. 
But the good news is that Jesus died for you. And if you want to get out of that pit today, if you'd be willing to pray, and, and this is between you and God, and this is a prayer that you offer up to him in faith, but if you are willing to pray and say, Dear God, I'm in a pit. Dear God, I'm lost. Dear God, if, if I were to die right now, I would go off into a Christless eternity. But God, I know that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. And right now, I want to put my total trust and faith in Christ. I believe Jesus came. I believe he died. I believe he rose again. I believe he's the very son of God. God, rescue me from the pit that I'm in. Not because of me and not because I deserve it, but because of Jesus. The altar's open. Keith is going to lead us in our invitation. Him today, if God is touching your heart about something... Maybe God's calling you to come and, and become a part of this church. Maybe God's calling you to be baptized. Whatever the decision is, if God has touched your heart and leading you to come, you come. Keith, why don't you lead us?